Have you ever wondered how many beautiful and successful girls are killed by scoundrels just to satisfy their lust? A whole life, dreams, opportunities, destroyed in an instant. And the worst part is that the criminals have been living among us for years. Today, we will visit the southern U.S. state of Arkansas and look at a case that has officially remained unsolved to this day. Our story begins at the University of Louisiana, where a young music student, Carol Yvette Larpenter, fell in love with her professor, Paul Dirksmeyer. Let's imagine that they were very happily married together, as their union lasted for years and gave the world a beautiful baby girl, Nona. December 26th, 1985, in the small town of Zachary in the state of Louisiana, was born Nona Carol Dirksmeyer. After the birth of her daughter, the family moved to the town of Dover, where the childhood and adolescence of the girl passed. Nona grew up a timid and insecure child. She liked to be alone and was reluctant to make friends with peers. At a young age, her birth father mistreated her, which affected the girl's emotional state. It is not known exactly how long this went on, but Nona never told anyone about it until her father's death in 1996. After his death, Nona grew stronger morally and tried to trust the people around her again. In middle school, Nona became friends with her classmate Kevin Jones. Teenagers trusted each other's secrets and helped each other in their studies. Gradually, friendship turned into something more and young people began to meet. In 2004, after graduating from Dover High School, Nona entered Arkansas Tech University, where she majored in music education, so she and her mother had to move from their hometown to a larger city, Russellville. Nona grew up to become a radiant beauty, who charmed others not only with her beauty and enchanting voice, but also with a huge kind heart. But it was difficult for her to be happy. Nona did not consider herself a beauty, because she did not see what her friends saw in her when they offered her to participate in beauty contests. But one day she agreed to the entreaties and entered the Miss Arkansas pageant. But she didn't really care about the prestige of the Miss Arkansas title or other honors. She just wanted to find a way to educate others about what happens to children who are abused by their parents, because the trauma she had previously suffered was forever etched in her soul. Nona was the perfect person to volunteer with, as she always wanted other children to be able to enjoy their childhood and have someone they could talk to if they needed to, rather than being silent for years because of fear. She was the reigning Miss Petit Jean Valley and entered beauty pageants to raise awareness about abuse. Kevin was always there to help Nona through some of the difficult times she was living through. People around them thought they were a perfect couple, and they were just very happy together. Their mutual feeling with Kevin grew stronger, they dated for several years, and made plans for the future. Kevin was a popular athlete at Arkansas Tech University. Besides, their families liked each other. Life flowed on its own. Nona's mom, Carol, remarried a while later to Dwayne Dipert, who was in no hurry to show paternal feelings for Nona, and that suited her just fine. When Dwayne came into her mother's life, Nona moved out and got her own separate apartment. On Christmas Eve 2005, Kevin, after coming home from college, went to Nona's apartment where they spent a wonderful romantic evening. After midnight, he drove home from Russellville to Dover. He called Nona when he got home to tell her he had made it home safe and sound. He overslept the next morning, and when he woke up and turned on his phone, he saw a text message from Nona. Good morning, Kendall Muffin. I love you, and hope you have a great day. Kevin knew that Nona had plans for December 15th, so he didn't bother her with a return message. Nona was working at a volunteer organization that day, and Kevin had invited his mother Janice to a Christmas party for teachers. But on the way to the party, Kevin told his mom that he was a little worried about Nona since she hadn't returned any of his calls during the day. He thought it was very strange that Nona hadn't returned his calls, because in four and a half years we had developed a certain stereotype, and they were sure to return each other's calls. He sent her a text message. Are you alive? But there was no response. But where was she and why wasn't she answering? In his haste to leave the party, Kevin called his friend Ryan who worked as a pizza delivery guy. He asked him to stop by Nona's house and check on her since his delivery area was near her house. Standing outside Nona's house, Ryan informed Kevin that the light was on in her apartment, but no one opened the door. Overcoming the rising tide of panic, Kevin and his mother hurried to Nona's apartment. On the spot, he realized he didn't have the keys to the apartment with him, so he and Ryan started knocking and ringing the doorbell, but no one opened. 
Panic was building, and Kevin felt like he was going crazy with worry. He knew the apartment had another sliding glass door in the back, and they ran to it. Kevin didn't think he could get in through that door, because he knew Nona always kept a stick in the handle to keep that entrance securely closed. But the stick wasn't there. As he reached the door and grasped the handle, Ryan touched it and shrieked, There she is, can't you see her? Inside, there was Nona lying on the floor, naked and motionless. Kevin ran into the apartment, flipped Nona over and hugged her. He yelled that she needed to be taken to the hospital right away. He wiped the blood from her face and tried CPR, but her eyes were closed and blood was flowing from the head wound. Kevin's mom, who went up to the apartment after the boys called emergency services. She said, My son's friend. I think she's dead. There's been a terrible accident. While waiting for help, Kevin picked Nona up in his arms and cradled her as if to keep her warm. His hands were covered in her blood. He was crying hard, but he couldn't wipe away the tears. A few minutes later, paramedics and police arrived. Nona was stripped naked, an empty condom wrapper lying on a table a few feet away. But there was no physical evidence that she had been raped. Her head had been crushed, probably by the heavy base of the lamp lying next to her. And whoever had delivered the fatal blow had first struck her in the face with a fist and then stabbed her several times with a knife with shallow cuts on her neck and shoulders. Before swinging the lampstand, the perpetrator strangled her with such force that he broke the hyoid bone in her neck. It became obvious that this was indeed a murder. Kevin was taken to the station to ask only a few questions about Nona. As a result, for more than three hours at the station, Kevin was interrogated about his relationship with Nona, how it happened that he was the one who found her body and where he spent the whole day. According to Kevin, it was not an interrogation, but a conviction on the part of the police officers that he was involved, accompanied by shouting and saying that they knew he did it. So from being Nona's boyfriend, Kevin Jones turned into a suspect in her murder. Kevin denied his involvement, and when he was asked to take a polygraph test, he agreed. During the lie detector, he was worried, sometimes hesitated over the answers. In the end, he was informed that he failed the test, which meant that it was Kevin who killed Nona. But the guy continued to deny his involvement in the tragedy. Nona and Kevin were high school sweethearts, who had been dating for five years. There was never anything in their relationship that could hint that Kevin had a temper or was crazy. But immediately all suspicions fell on him. But why didn't the police look more closely at other possible suspects? The police said they checked the alibis of all the potential suspects, thus settling on Kevin. On December 22nd, 2005, the state medical examiner's office determined that 19-year-old Nona Dirksmeyer died from multiple blunt and acute injuries that included stab wounds on the back right side of her neck and superficial cuts on the front and right side of her neck, shoulder and ear. You won't believe how unfortunate the crime scene was, and you'll be shocked when you hear that the person who could have done this was lurking in the shadows all along. But it begs the question that if it wasn't Kevin, who did it and why? But let's continue in order. The investigation was initially assigned to Detective Mark Frost, who had never investigated a murder before. From day one, the investigation faced several problems. First, Kevin had seriously compromised the evidence by touching his girlfriend's body, hugging her and cradling her as he tried to bring Nona back to life. Second, multiple paramedics and police officers arrived at the scene, touching and moving potential evidence. Indeed, key evidence, such as the condom wrapper, the lamp and Nona's cell phone, were moved multiple times and their original locations were not recorded. As for the condom wrapper, police were unable to lift any fingerprints from it to determine whose they might have been. Nevertheless, within a week, the crime and the perpetrator were fully solved, according to police. And of course it was Kevin. The investigation was certain that he had deliberately created an elaborate disguise, using his mother and a friend to help find the body and thereby throw suspicion off himself. He left a condom wrapper as a ruse to make it look like a stranger had taken advantage of Nona and killed her. The motive was known as alleged infidelity, which Kevin happened to learn about a few days before the crime. But no arrest followed. Despite the fact that the police believed Kevin was guilty, the investigation of the crime, led by Mark Frost, eventually took several months. During that period, from Nona's death to Kevin's arrest, rumors abounded around town. The police told Nona's mother, who had once loved Kevin, that Kevin was responsible for her daughter's death. 
They told her that he went on a rampage and killed Nona when he entered her apartment and saw a condom wrapper. He that Nona was with another man. They believed he had staged the crime scene. On March 31st, 2006, police finally announced the arrest of Kevin Jones for the murder of Nona Dirksmeyer. A whole new reality had set in for Kevin. The publicized evidence included what seemed to be irrefutable proof. Kevin's palm print was on the very lamp used to kill Nona. The murder of 19-year-old Nona Dirksmeyer came as a terrible shock to the city of Russellville, so it received more statewide publicity than any criminal case in years. Before the trial began, the defense asked for a change of venue, as the public was adamant about their suspicions and rumors, and the defense felt that Kevin would not get a fair trial. The request was granted, so the trial began in Ozark, which is almost 30 miles from Russellville. Jeff Phillips, an assistant prosecutor, presented Nona Dirksmeyer's case to the jury as a case of jealous boyfriend rage. According to the prosecutor, it was easy for Kevin to show up at Nona's apartment unannounced because he had a key. While there, he likely found a text message on Nona's phone from another man, or a used condom in a package on the table. That's when he went on a rampage and attacked his girlfriend. He beat her, slashed her with a knife, and finally stabbed her with a heavy lamp base, leaving a bloody palm print on the bulb itself. Investigator Mark Frost, who discovered the palm print on the light bulb through forensics, determined that it was left there at the time of the crime, and not later when Kevin, his mother, and his friend discovered Nona's body. Lying on her body and then hugging her, the prosecution said, was a deliberate attempt to destroy evidence at the crime scene, and in fact police found very little usable evidence. But on the night the police questioned Kevin, they didn't think they would get straight answers, especially about his alibi which, according to the investigator, came together a little too well as of late. According to the prosecution, on the morning of the crime, Kevin left his Dover home around 10.30 a.m. as he waited for the plumber to leave. After that, Kevin's phone went silent for an hour and a half. The prosecution's chronology of events looked like this. 10.30 a.m. Kevin leaves Dover to visit Nona in Russellville. 10.55 a.m. He enters the apartment, argues with Nona, kills her, leaves his palm print on the light bulb. 11.10 a.m. Removes a condom wrapper from the scene. 11.15 a.m. Leaves back to Dover, returns around noon. There was one small snag in this prosecution chronology, however, and that was that Kevin's grandmother testified at trial that she saw her grandson at the gas station at 11.30 a.m. on December 15. According to her, she talked to him and gave him money for lunch. And if that were true, Kevin wouldn't have had time to drive to Nona's apartment and back, let alone kill her. There was only one piece of evidence at all, a bloody palm print on a light bulb. But maybe it's a completely innocent situation, and the blood got on the bulb the moment the body was discovered when Kevin was trying to revive Nona. He could have just accidentally touched the light bulb. The EMT said the light bulb was about a foot away from the body. While they were digging into the case, attorney said, they kept finding strange things in the investigation by first homicide detective Mark Frost. The only place where fingerprints were lifted appeared to be the area around the body. The police officers who inspected Nona's apartment after the attack did not pay proper attention to the blood near the front door, the blinds, which were also covered in blood. Nor did they examine the bathroom for possible fingerprints. Nothing was done except in the area around the body. The bloody palm print was not the only evidence on the lamp. It turned out that later on, the police did manage to lift some fingerprints from the base of that lamp as well, and the prints that were on the working part of the murder weapon, the rod and the base, did not belong to Kevin Jones. They belonged to an unidentified person. The court learned that in addition to Kevin Janice and Ryan entering the apartment, so did several paramedics and police officers go around the crime scene, and some evidence was touched and moved. As for Kevin's palm print on the lamp, the same lamp that police said was the murder weapon. The defense argued that the palm print was on the lamp, and it could indeed have been when Kevin found Nona's body. Nona's cell phone was also found in the apartment, but it was not tested for fingerprints or DNA. Kevin's lawyers fought hard for his good name, proving to the court that there was no evidence against him at all. The defense used the testimony of Kevin's grandmother, which showed that he didn't have time to drive to and from Nona's apartment. The defense also told the jury that the perpetrator had several cuts and bruises on his hands and body after beating Nona. Police took pictures of Kevin, the front and back of his hands and his body when they spoke to him on December. 15 and there were no bruises, scratches, 
or any abrasions on his body. Then there was a strange story about Nona's cell phone. It was at the scene, but the battery was missing. The perpetrator must have touched the phone since he removed the battery, the defense said, but the phone was never checked for fingerprints. The defense had been asking for months to take a look at the phone, perhaps to check its electronic history to see who Nona was texting or talking to. But when they finally got the phone and turned it over to a forensic scientist for information, they found that the device's memory had been wiped. The state then admitted to giving the phone to Nona's stepfather, Dwayne Deepert, stating that no more information could be obtained from it. The loss of the phone's memory was a blow, because while phone company experts were able to recover messages sent to Nona, her responses, which could have identified the suspect, were lost forever. Remember the polygraph test? In court, the defense said it had checked the polygraph examiner's file, and the person who administered the test was not a certified polygraph examiner. This was an attempt to pressure Kevin into confessing. There was an entire town watching who were largely convinced of Kevin's guilt. But was he guilty? The five jurors were very enthusiastic about the case. After eight hours of deliberation, they returned to the courtroom, and they found Kevin Jones not guilty of the murder of Nona Dirksmeyer. An emotional dam burst in the courtroom after the acquittal was handed down. The decision devastated those who loved Nona and thought Kevin was at fault. But those who thought that was the end of it were very much mistaken, for this was only the beginning. Prosecutors were forced to say that the acquittal came after a botched police investigation. In the months that followed, Kevin and his family assigned Todd Steffi, a part-time police officer, to investigate the murder. Todd immediately sent the condom wrapper to be analyzed, and the lab found several traces of male DNA on it. Since this DNA did not belong to Kevin, authorities began looking for a needle in a haystack until an unrelated arrest forced Gary Dunn to visit the local police station. It was then that Todd Steffi was able to obtain his DNA and find a match to the one on the condom wrapper. On top of that, Todd also noticed that Gary had been out shopping on December 13th, not December 15th as he had reported in the first interview, which put a hole in his alibi. After prosecutors announced on February 6th, 2008, that the DNA on the condom wrapper matched Dunn's DNA, the prosecution team focused its attention on him. Gary Dunn was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. The prosecution alleged that he either took advantage of Nona or attempted to do so before beating her to death. Gary Dunn and his wife lived in the same apartment complex as Nona. A police investigation later proved that Gary had been stalking the 19-year-old beauty queen 24-7 as his window was directly across the street from the victim's home. Interestingly, other residents of the complex insisted that Gary had recently moved into the neighborhood and said little about their new neighbor. He kept mostly to himself and rarely had friends in his apartment. In addition, several residents also mentioned that Gary had a troubled relationship with his wife. It remains a mystery how Gary Dunn was able to get into the apartment, as Nona's friends claimed that she always kept the door locked. The prosecutor suggested that Dunn might have knocked on Nona's door and introduced himself as her neighbor who came to ask about her cat. Because Nona's love of animals was known to others, and with Gary's daily surveillance, it would have been easy for him to find out. And indeed, at the scene a bag of cat food was found on the floor, which had not been opened. When questioned, Gary's wife confirmed that he had been peeping on Nona for a long time in order to study her lifestyle. The girl pitied stray cats, taking them from the street, and it became a great excuse to get into her apartment. On December 15th, 2005 a neighbor knocked on her apartment under the pretext that he brought her stray kittens, and Nona opened the door, then he broke in and attacked the girl, but Gary pleaded not guilty. When he was introduced in court, Gary's lawyers said that his DNA was a partial match to the one found at the crime scene, which meant that it was impossible to convict someone based on that evidence alone. In addition, the defense also argued that Kevin was the actual killer and should not have been allowed to go free. Such an argument instilled enough doubt in the minds of the jury and the first trial ended in a mistrial. During the second trial, the court heard that Gary had previously been convicted of assaulting a woman back in 2002. It transpired that he had previously been charged with attempted murder and second-degree battery after he attacked a female jogger in Russellville. He was acquitted of the charges at that time, but found guilty of the second-degree battery charge and sentenced to six years in prison. The defense also questioned the DNA evidence. Prosecutors argued that Gary was linked to the crime scene by DNA found on a condom wrapper, 
while defense counsel disputed the alleged coincidence and argued that the evidence could not be trusted because of how it was collected and how the crime scene was contaminated. Gary's trial ended in a deadlock for the jury. They were never able to decide if he was guilty or not. A second trial was held, but the result was the same. However, the evidence was once again inconclusive and the jury was divided for the second time. Although the second trial forced authorities to release Gary, he was sent to jail on a separate weapons charge before being arrested and convicted of kidnapping, attempted kidnapping, and indecent exposure for two unrelated incidents in 2019. Gary pleaded no contest to those charges and was sentenced to prison. So today Gary, who was sentenced to 15 years, is in custody at the Arkansas Department of Corrections office in Wrightsville, where he will remain at least until his parole eligibility date. Prosecutors had planned to try Gary a third time, but decided against it, and instead asked the judge to dismiss the charges against him. Despite this, the charges could be refiled. Kevin Jones was able to persevere through the unjust charges and sued the police who investigated the situation for ignoring the facts and being irresponsible with the evidence. In 2010, he went on to study law. Kevin now works as a lawyer and is committed to helping those who suffer from police negligence or unprofessionalism. He currently resides in Little Rock, where he is happily married and engaged in a labor of love that has become his life's work. From Kevin Jones's interview, Now I know exactly how it feels when people think you did something you didn't do, and I would never wish that on anyone else. I still sometimes have dreams with her, with Nona, and I see her there again and again. The conclusion of this story begs the fair question, Will justice ever prevail for Nona? The life of a young, beautiful and talented girl, it will not return. But I want to believe that if the criminal did not receive his punishment from the people who represent the law on earth, then from God's punishment he will not be able to hide. It's just a matter of time.